This is Asia Argento, one of Italy's best-known actresses. In October last year, the US magazine The New Yorker published Argento's allegations of sexual assault at the hands of Harvey Weinstein. The reaction Argento received in the Italian news media was very different. Denunciare tutto vent'anni dopo, io lo trovo addirittura un po', un po vigliaco, oltre che triste. Non, non sei vittima, sei complice. In quelle condizioni tu, avresti condizioni? potuto andare a dire di no. Non dire che, certo. che l'ho voluto. Scusate, scusate, scusate. Asia, Asia che l'ho voluto. Allora, mi sembra Deo, francamente. Io ho sentito. I interviewed Asia Argento a few days after her story was published in The New Yorker. She couldn't stand the public abuse anymore. The editor-in-chief of the newspaper Libero was extremely brutal, really attacking her. La realtà è che se uno vuole ottenere dei favori e dà delle prestazioni sessuali a casa mia si chiama prostituzione. Io non ritengo che fossero sessisti. I wouldn't say his comments were sexist. You have to know the man. It is well known that his journalistic career and his reputation are based on how direct and how blunt he is, how crude he is. He cuts to the chase. Asia Argento's case is really a typical example of the recurring stereotypes and misrepresentation in media coverage of sexual violence cases against women. There's a tendency to split the victims of sexual harassment into two categories, the innocent ones and the women who asked for it. Quando una prima acconsente e poi se ne pente e allora sì che togli credibilità alle storie delle donne che veramente vengono violentate. Una cosa che mi ha colpito particolarmente. Something I was really struck by is that in much of the coverage of the Asia Argento affair, the article or the report would be illustrated with a picture from a film she had starred in, in which she played a lap dancer who kissed a dog. It was as if to say, look how dubious her morals are. La dubbia moralità di questa persona. È un'immagine che ti fa capire una certa disponibilità a fare qualsiasi cosa pur di entrare in un film, o no? I think the treatment of Asia Argento proved to be quite illuminating in terms of why women won't talk or why they may be reluctant to point the finger at powerful figures. The treatment of Argento contrasted sharply with what was happening in the US media, where allegations of harassment were being met with solidarity. Let me be very clear. There is no excuse for this alleged behavior. It is systematic and pervasive. And accountability. It was a stunning headline to wake up to. Matt Lauer, the longtime host of the Today Show, has been fired. Six months on from the Weinstein revelations, more than a dozen major media personalities accused of harassment in the United States have either resigned or been sacked. In Italy, there have been no exposés of harassment in the news media industry. Yet, according to Solon De Luca, a television presenter and producer, such stories are not hard to find. Very often, before becoming a journalist, they used to say to me, you want to become a journalist? Come out with me. If you want the job, you need to do something for me. Sometimes it was more subtle. I would like to see you tonight, in a dress. I got harassed when I worked at Rai, our public broadcaster. Then, when I was at Sky Italia, one night, I was working late, alone with my editor-in-chief, and we disagreed on a couple of things. He looked at me and said, if you want to play who's got the bigger dick, you're making a big mistake. I was quite frightened, to be honest. I didn't know how to react. I was speechless. Harassment is everywhere in Italy. Just because there have been no denunciations to date doesn't mean it isn't happening in the media as well. The problem is, it's difficult to expose such cases, especially when they happen in the industry that is supposed to be doing the exposing. Italian media, Italian television especially, have become notorious for how they treat and represent women. Objectification, stereotyping and worse are common. Last year on Channel 5, Italy's second most watched channel, the talent show Amici staged an elaborate prank on a pop singer. Emma viene chiamata in studio, ma un ballerino nostro complice si rivelerà molto attratto dal suo corpo. What happened on the set of Amici was an extreme case, but very much part of a trend that began on the same TV network in the 1980s. With the liberalization of the media, 
Italy's future Prime Minister, Silvio Berlusconi, founded the Mediaset Empire. Semi-naked showgirls, usually alongside much older men, soon became the formula to follow. So much so, they got a label in the industry, the Vellino. This term refers specifically to the women who featured in a satirical news show from 1988 called Striscia la Notizia. They would deliver the news to the two male hosts, who would then read it out. As competition between TV channels intensified, the presence of beautiful, young, half-naked women became a standard gimmick in TV entertainment. Mediaset especially offers a rich gallery of examples. Paperissima Sprint, Tiki Taka, Ciao Darwin. There are lots of shows that still use women this way. OK, there are still veline on Striscia la Notizia, but it's in the name of satire. You could make the same criticisms about cheerleaders at sport events in the U.S. In a way, it's like a beauty pageant. Americans love to give us moral lectures, but they even have cheerleading competitions. To me, this seems much more sexist. While the men are shown as athletes, the women just have to throw their legs up in the air. I think that's disgraceful. The veline are the symbol of a way of making TV. The concept of a woman who's on stage and maybe dances, but doesn't speak. They don't represent actual women. It's an idea that was manufactured to serve the entertainment industry by taking a stereotype to the extreme. It was a way to satisfy a particular idea of what the average Italian viewer wants. A viewer that, paradoxically, is always assumed to be male. There's never an average female viewer. There are no male veline. The fact that it has overwhelmingly been men deciding what Italian audiences want to see on screen and in the papers only partly explains the enduring sexism in the country's media. After all, male executives dominate media boardrooms in most countries. Another factor, a more telling one, is the power imbalance between men and women in Italian society. According to a recent index by the World Economic Forum, Italy has the widest gender gap in Western Europe. But some see signs that things are changing, slowly, for the better, including in the media. In Italy, there's a divide. On one side, the older, conservative people who don't acknowledge or even see the problem. On the other side, there's a younger generation who are more open, more worldly, and more critical. A major difference between the era when the Vellina became popular and today is that we're no longer limited to just Italian TV. It's much easier to see what's going on in other parts of the world. There's no question that sexism in Italian television is alive and well. But there has been a change in the way such blatantly sexist practices are received by the public. For instance, in March 2017, there was this RAI program, Parliamone Sabato, which asked why Italian men have a preference for Eastern European women. There was a big reaction against it on social media, to the extent that the producers decided to cancel the show. The changes here have not been as dramatic as we might have seen with the Me Too campaign in the US. But awareness is growing, and society is changing, slowly. We all have to make sure that these baby steps continue and get ever bigger. As for Azira Argento, since her bruising encounters with Italian media, she has said the country's climate of tension and culture of victim blaming was too much for her and her family. And she spends much of her time outside Italy.